Come to find out that 75% of the people who said they first heard about that brand, that women's clothing boutique, was through Facebook ads, Facebook and Instagram ads. So I had nothing to do with her stories, nothing, right? It was the ad first. And then how they got to the website today, the top two reasons was from her stories or they just remembered her. They had remembered it. It's time for the spicy curry hot take. The segment of the show when I get just a little bit spicy. Let me quote Mark Twain for you. He said, it's not what we don't know that gets us into trouble. It's the things we know for certain that just ain't so. Now, I believe what we don't know about our customers is hurting us. But I also believe there's some deeply held beliefs, myths we have about our customers that just aren't true. As an example, I think a lot of people believe they know the reason their customers buy from them, but often they're off base. So one of the things we talk about in this show is a brand who believed the two main reasons people bought from them were one, cost savings, and two, the fact that their product was environmentally friendly. It turned out, as they asked their customers, less than 10% of people believe those two reasons were important in purchasing. And so... Can you imagine, what if you were crafting all of your sales pitches in a way that only landed with one out of 10 in your audience? Or you could shift it, and when you really know why people buy, now you can craft your message so that it strikes a chord with nine out of 10 of your ideal prospects. So what myths do you have that need to be busted? Hopefully we'll answer that on this show. Hot take over. Well, hello, and welcome to another edition of the e-commerce evolution podcast. I'm your host, Brett Curry, CEO of OMG Commerce. And today we're talking about, do you really know your customer? Do you know them as well as you think do you do? I mean, do you really, really know them? Because if you knew your customers better, I bet you'd do at least a few things differently. And so today my guest is Trevor Crump. He is one of the co-founders of Bestie bestie app and uh, so excited about this topic i'm very passionate about it i love the tool that trevor and team have designed trevor is a fellow podcast host so you know when you get two podcast guys together you know it's gonna be a little bit nutty you know it's gonna go off the rails it's gonna be valuable but it may go off the rails so with that trevor how's it going man welcome to the show and, and thanks for taking the time uh yeah man i'm super excited to be here uh really really appreciate it yeah i love um I actually love interviewing other podcast hosts because Dude, so it's fun. It's a blast. Like, you know, sometimes when you're interviewing somebody, you just, you never know, like, are they going to be short-winded? Are they going to be long-winded? Am I going to have to be cutting this person off? Am right, I going to have to right. be stretching for yeah. questions, you know? And, um, and so sometimes it, sometimes like, sometimes the episode doesn't go where you think it should go. Um, but it always turns out super entertaining and super valuable. And so I, I'm a big fan of it, man. Yeah, me too. Because yeah, really, I don't know which is worse, right? You have a guest who really doesn't say much. That's difficult. Uh, but you can also have someone that just doesn't know when to stop. And then you've got to interrupt because it needs to be a dialogue. If it's not a dialogue, it's not interesting radio. And so, yeah, I like interviewing podcast hosts as well. Because what I'm always trying to do, just 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 for fun, when, when someone asks me a question, I'm a guest on another podcast, I'm trying to think, how do I package this answer in a way that's that's authentic, meaningful, fun, but also where I don't talk for seven straight minutes because the host wants to talk too, right? Totally. And, and, the, and the listener needs that. So totally. So that's awesome, yeah. man. So uh, first of all, what is what is your pod, and why did you start down the path of podcasting? And uh, yeah, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. Um, so our podcast is called The Unstoppable Marketer. Um, it's specifically meant to interview marketers and entrepreneurs in the D2C space, you know? So we interview founders, we interview VPs of marketing, CMOs, et cetera. Uh, and it's just really to, to figure out like, what are, like, where were you before? Where are you now? Where are you going? And what are you doing to get there? You know, and what are some of those big mistakes? Um, and so, yeah, we, uh, you know, I've got a following on social media, on Instagram and TikTok. That's that's a decent size. 
Um, and so I was, was doing a really good job at the short form content side of things. Um, at the time, uh, our main business was actually a marketing agency. So rather than like, you're, you're very specific on the YouTube side of things, Google side of things, right? We were very specific in like TikTok and meta, like that was like our big time bread and butter. Um, little Google too, as well, just as ancillary, but TikTok and meta was like, where, as well, kind of, kind of provides a good underpinning. Absolutely. TikTok and other socials, Google kind of closes the deal. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And so we just, you know, I was getting so much traction, so much interaction on my short form content that I needed to complete. We wanted to complete that funnel. And so we said, let's, let's create a podcast for the people who I, I just learned that anybody can BS short form content. Uh, it's pretty yes, easy, especially with very AI true. nowadays. Like if you're good at speaking, um, you can literally have AI write everything out for you. And as long as you can present it, you can look like you're super knowledgeable when you may not be. And so we said, let's create a podcast. And and me and my my business partner, we love to just talk and we love to meet other people. And so we created the podcast and it was, it's been awesome ever since, man. It's been really successful. Uh, it's, it's, it's got us a lot of good contacts and also a lot of business. Yeah, that, that's one of the my favorite parts about the podcast, just the people you meet, right? You get to hang yeah. out for an hour with smart people like you, uh, you know, grilling you with questions and learning, and and they get to share that with people. And you're right, you can fake a two minute, one minute TikTok video. It's pretty hard to fake, you know, a 45 minute interview. And so the 100%. truth comes out when you go long 100%. form, uh, which is super fun. So uh, let's dive into a few things. First of all, um, so so to kind of give a preview for the audience, like we're going to talk about. How do we get to know our customers better? How do we craft surveys? What do we ask? When do we ask it? How do we then use that to improve all the metrics we love, like you know, lowering CAC and raising LTV and all kinds of good stuff? So I can't wait to get into that. We're also going to talk about some surprising lessons, like, hey, you thought this about your customer, but then actually the opposite was true. So we're going to get into that in a minute. But you ran an agency, and then you kind of pivoted to Bestie App. Talk to us about that. Like, why'd you make the pivot? When did that happen? Why did that happen? Um, yeah, super good question, man. So uh, actually, before I started the agency, I was I was formerly a CMO for a big eight-figure brand out here in Salt Lake City called Fawn Design, which is a, a women's diaper bag and accessory company. And uh, at the time, um, this was back in like 2018, like attribution tools were really, really expensive. I mean, they still are, right? But they were really expensive back then. And, you know, I could not convince my CMO or not my CMO, my CFO to uh, get us, uh, like, give me the budget for an attribution tool. And so we just kind of, you know, we were, we were doing a little research. We were trying to figure some things out at the time back in 2018, it was over attributing everything to us. Right. So now it's under attributing back then it was over attributing, meaning like Clavio. If my shop, if I said I made a million bucks that month, Clavio's telling me that I made five hundred thousand. Facebook's telling me I made seven hundred thousand. Google's telling me I made three hundred thousand, but I'm only making a million, right? Yeah. So according to all the tools, the aggregate is two million, but you only made a yeah. million. And so yeah, exactly. was, was over indexing, over attributing now post I was fifteen, fourteen, really. Uh, yeah. Under attributing, right? Hundred percent. Yep. So it's like, hey, we got to figure this out. So we were just doing me and my ecom director. We were doing some just just like brainstorming. And we saw that our email open rate for our thank you email was like 80%, right? And normally like our our open rates back then were like 20, 30%. And I'm like, holy cow, 80% open rate, 50% click through rate. This is like massively valuable real estate. You know, it's that confirmation, right? Hey, your order was placed. Here's your shipping information, right? So we just got a freemium account on SurveyMonkey and we asked three questions. We said, hey, how did you hear about us? Um, how, what brought you to the website today and how long have you known about us? And let's see if that just information gives us some solid information. And we started learning things about our customer um, that we had no idea. Um, and it became the most pivotal um, piece of the puzzle when it came to us understanding how our customers heard about us. And so we just, I mean, we just, we started running surveys like crazy through that. So the moment we got enough attribution surveys, then we started asking questions about why they were buying the product. Then we started asking questions about who they were, what podcasts they listened to, what, what influencers they followed. And, and it just became the catalyst to so much that we did. And so fast forward, uh, it helped us scale from this seven figures to an eight figure business. Um, fast forward back to this agency. And we just kept finding that, you know, a lot of D2C brands, like all of our, all these, all these companies that we're working with these merchants, they, 
none of them were talking to their customers. Uh, the way they were talking to their customer was usually through DMs or like an Instagram poll. That was like the majority of their their conversations. And so we thought, hey, listen, remember we did, we did this back then. Let's find a way to automate this and build this process out and and really help uh, brands get a better qualitative understanding of who their customer is and what makes them tick. And so we started to develop Bestie in um, 2022, uh, you know, just going through developers overseas and contractors and Fiverr and, you know, going all, you know, down all these routes. Um, and eventually, uh, we, you know, we came, we came with product market fit in, in first of this year, got approved on the Shopify app store uh, and really just started grinding and, and getting more and more customers and kind of the rest has, has been history. Love it, man. And and I know you guys are really, really growing rapidly and I love this process. So let, let's talk about those three questions for just a minute. And you guys went low tech, right? Or lower tech, right? You, you. Oh yeah. Very low tech. Thank you email. Yep. You used survey monkey, right? You, we got inexpensive tools available if you need them. And I know Bessie is inexpensive as well, but yeah. How'd you hear about us? What brought you here today? And how long have you known about us? I, and I think, you know, once you get these answers and it like just blows your mind, you're like, wait a minute. I, I, I didn't know that. And now that I know that, now I want to know more. And once I know more, totally. then we can, we can start changing things. And so uh, what were some of the surprising things you guys learned? In the, and you said that was called Fawn Design was the name of the, the brand. What were some of the surprising things you learned in that first round of questions? Uh, two, two really big things that we learned. Um, one thing that we learned was that uh, like 40% of our audience, the first time they heard about us was through word of mouth. So that was the biggest channel, right? And and as you know, um, there's no attribution tool that can account no. for word of mouth, no, right? No, there will be. And so it was, we always had this like fear of, okay, hey, our, we're at our like highest CAC possible right now. So any, any more money we spend, we start to go over that CAC and things become inefficient. And so that was like a huge learning as we were stuck in this like spend of like $50,000, $60,000 a month. And when we, when we saw that, it's like, okay, hey, 40% of our customers first heard about us through other people buying the bags and then walking around with them. So essentially, the way we sell more bags is by selling more bags. Exactly. Does that make yeah. sense? Because and each so bag you sell is now a, a walking, a walking advertisement. billboard. And now that, that new customer is not just the value of the new customer, but now they're going to be you know, attracting other, other customers. We, well, not only that, but moms, like if you know anything about the mom world, um, anything that helps moms be better moms or yeah. look like better moms. Okay. Yes. From like a style aesthetic perspective, they are going to shout it from the rooftops. Absolutely. Right? So not only did we say, let's, let's try doubling spend and just see what happens. Like, can I get approval? from our CFO and can we go from 50 grand a month to a hundred thousand dollars a month and just see you what happens. The CFO didn't sleep good that night, Trevor. No, the CFO was but, like, man, I don't want to release this money. But, but, but after like 40 works. days, all of a sudden like CAC went up a little bit, but it was just like, hey, just keep with it, keep with it, keep with it. The other thing that we learned was that our buying cycle was under 30 days. So like that was the other thing for us. So it was like, okay, cool. We theoretically should see the fruits of the labors of the word of mouth by doubling our spend within a month here. So like, it's not like we're going to have to go six months and yeah. hope this is going to work and have really, really bad CAC for six months, but then it's going to start to get better. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, so that was huge Love for that. us. So you found this key insight, word of mouth is driving 40% of business. So let's just sell more bags to sell even more bags. But then knowing 30 day selling cycle, we don't have to commit to a test for that long. So let's commit to a test for 30, 40 days. Now we should be able to get some really meaningful data and see if our, our theory was correct. Totally. And then with the other thing that we did is we built like, you know, I know there's a lot of arguments and debates around loyalty programs, if they work or not. Um, and we took our stab at building a loyalty program because we thought that was a no brainer. Like if, if people are organically sharing about us, 40% of people are organically sharing about us, let's build a loyalty program. And the original loyalty program we built didn't work very well for us. We did just your standard loyalty program that you're going to find on any other website. And it just ended up being more work to the customer to go through those hoops, you know, and they were going to share about it anyway. But what we actually ended up doing that started moving the needle big time is we created incentives to say, hey, not only when you like 
if you shout to us, like shout out to us um, on social media, like we're going to refund like five orders a week and we're going to give anybody who shouts to us, they're going to enter in a giveaway and get a hundred dollars off their next order. And, you know, so we just did, started doing a bunch of things like that, that started getting us more content and more opportunities to work with new influencers. And uh, yeah, it was, it was, it was awesome, dude. So that was, that was one massive learning. I, I can go into a ton that we, we learned there, but yeah, it was yeah, it's really so cool. Good because, and I think that's something to keep in mind is like with loyalty programs, especially if you got a product like this where tight community, it, it, it's beneficial to the shopper to share your product, makes them feel good, look good, all those things. People are going to share anyway. So if you create a loyalty program, it's overly complex, overly hard to understand and feels like a lot of work. You're not gaining any grant, right? So people are going to share anyway. But I love this where just, yeah, make it fun, make it random, make it like, hey, you're going to share anyway. We'll, we'll do these little fun things and celebrate us or shout at us on social media and we'll make it worth your while. Um, super, super smart. So um, let's let's dive in then and we'll, we'll probably drill into some other lessons there from from Fawn because I am interested in that. But but I want to uh, shift and, and, and fast forward a little bit. So now with Bestie, I know you're working with lots of different brands. What are What are some of the scenarios where Brand thought one thing was true about their customer, did a survey, found actually that the opposite or something totally different was true. Let's talk about some examples. Yeah. Um, yeah, maybe the first one that comes to my mind, and I, and I say these people, they, they've given us permission to, to talk about this story. Um, so there's a brand out there called Pajamas. And uh, Pajamas is like a built-in potty training aid for parents who are trying to teach their kids how to not wet the bed at night. So essentially it's it's like reusable diapers, right? That you can rewash, kids can pee in it and it doesn't soak their bed. And when they originally came to their agency, they said, "Hey, um people buy us for two reasons. They buy us because um it saves them money cuz cuz pull-ups and diapers cost a lot of money. Number one, so it's going to save you money." And number two reason is it's going to save the environment because I think every pull-up takes 15 years to decompose. And so there was this big eco push that they were trying to go. So sure enough, the agency that they're working with creates all the content around those two solutions. And because this is such a problem solution product, um, people see it and problem solution products tend to sell themselves usually. Now, when you really, really hit on the actual reason somebody buys it, they sell 10x more. So um, they were running those ads for quite some time. And then we got Bestie set up and we said, hey, I know that the, these are the two reasons why you say people are buying from you. But what if what if we, we, we just created a survey and we asked one question and the question said, what motivated you to buy pajamas today? And we listed those two, right? Uh, say, cost savings, um, eco-friendly and then we added three or four more responses with one open-ended response to you know like an other open-ended response and you know after after a few you know a week or so we got enough statistical significance data that said um okay let's see let's see if eco-friendly and diaper savings costs are the number one and number two drivers and eco-friendly accounted for about seven percent of the reason why people purchased and uh, cost savings accounted for about nine percent. So two of the two of the the lower priority reasons that people are purchasing. That really interesting. So what were the what were the winners? So the number one, which was fifty three percent, so over half the time somebody's buying, was they wanted to shorten the window it took for them to potty train their child. So they didn't want to have a six year old, seven year old, eight year old wetting the bed. They wanted to get them in. They wanted to fix that, nip that in the bud quicker. So that was the number one reason by 50, 53% shortening up that window. And then the second reason, the second reason, which was like 24% was to improve child's confidence because no five-year-old uh, feels com like confident going to bed with a pull-up on, you know? So, but if, if they're wearing pajamas, they don't feel like they're a little baby anymore. Dude, I love that so much. And, and as a parent, and I don't know if you know this, Trevor, a lot of the listeners do. My wife and I have eight kids. Count them, eight kids. Oh oldest, my gosh, uh, dude! Out of the house, second oldest is in in uh, college. Yeah, yeah, lot, lots of kids. So, dude, the number of pull we calculated one time the number of pulls, the numbers of di number of diapers, and now I forgot. But I think it's like it's like four to eight thousand, four to six thousand per kid, or something like that is the average. So you you do the math there. It's an insane amount of of pull ups and diapers. 
they are expensive. What's really interesting, I think there's a difference between this is the business owner mindset. This is what we think is most important from a business standpoint. But then when you put your parent hat on and your parent lens on your parent glasses, so to speak, this is what's important. But you know, when you when you look at that, like, yes, we want to save money and yes, we want to save the environment, right? And but this what's interesting about the environmental issue is in surveys, we see that all the time show up way lower than the business owner thinks. And that's not to say that you shouldn't be environmentally friendly. People do care about that, but it's just not at the top of the list when it comes to where am I going to spend my money, like like we think that it is. Uh, but in this case, yeah, it's my it's my kid's confidence and my kid's psychology. I'm motivated for that. I'm motivated to spend money for that. And let's face it, man, I don't want to change wet sheets for the next five months, next year. No way. Uh, if we can get this trained faster, let's do it right now. So love that. Kudos to you guys for asking the questions. And really kudos to the business owner for being open to it. Because I think some business owners approach it like, no, 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 no. I, I know my customer. I know this is the, the reason. These are the reasons. But that ain't necessarily true. So love that. Any other kind of aha moments, surprising, I thought this thing, it was actually the opposite. Yeah, uh, I think maybe another, okay, yeah, another one was uh, there was a women's clothing boutique. And this one's a little bit more on the attribution side. On, on the women's clothing boutique, uh, they, they're they a, a big, massive clothing boutique here in, uh, in the Salt Lake area. And they kind of felt like they were hitting a wall when it came to their ad spend, right? Like, Hey, nobody can really help us here. Like, we just need to find a good, you know, either a good in-house marketer or a good agency who could, we can just trust that are going to spend our money effectively. This is what our CAC is. This is what our LTV is, and and this is what it's going to be. We're going to be an X million dollar a month business, and that's it. Um, and they kind of felt like that that was their fate for a little bit, you know. And so we started to run attribution service, and it, just back to those same three questions, right? How did you hear about us? Where did you come from? And how long have you known about us? Um, and this this founder, uh, the way they sell a lot of their clothing is she is wildly, wildly interactive in her stories. So she'll jump in her stories and she will try clothes on and she'll say, hey, I am this tall. I weigh this much. You know, this is how my body fits in it. And people just love it because they're like, oh, cool. I can I can see that. I can visualize it. I'm the same size or I'm a little bit bigger. I'm a little bit smaller. So I'm going to need a small versus a medium or, or what what have you. And so she just tries on every new piece of clothing that comes in. So if you go look at their stories, they've got a hundred stories, not a hundred stories, 25 stories a day. Right. And, and you know, they were convinced like, Hey, we're the ones who are selling Google analytics attribution. It's all telling us people are coming from our Instagram referral. That's where everything, that's where everything's coming from. And so we said, let's just run an attribution test. Let's see what's going on here. Come to find out that 75% of the people who said they first heard about that brand, that women's clothing boutique, was through Facebook ads, Facebook and Instagram ads. So it had nothing to do with her stories, nothing, right? It was the ad first. And then how they got to the website today, the top two reasons was from her stories or they just remembered her. They had remembered it, okay? So we came back and said, hey, the insights here, the actual insights here for you are I know once again, so this goes back to what was happening over at Fawn Design, right? This word of mouth thing. It's like, hey, I know that it looks like the people who are buying are people who are just like are coming just from you guys organically, but they first started following you and heard about you through your ads. Why don't you try to double your ad spend and see what happens? They doubled their ad spend for three months um, and their business has 5X'd since then. And they're scaling and growing and opening up new locations all because it was just like, oh my goodness. We've got the right LTV for this, you know, um, and let's just let's just test it out and see what happens. And sure enough, uh, they're absolutely crushing it. Their their uh, MER, so their marketing efficient rate, efficiency rate, had didn't increase, didn't decrease, right? It stayed the same, but they they five x their their monthly revenue because of just putting the money where they need it's to amazing. put it. And it, it, it kind of goes back to the you know first touch, last touch type of argument. And yes, we've got tools that. That can calculate that. And I like attribution tools. There's several I like, you know, Triple Oil, North Beam, there's several that are good, but they're not perfect, right? And so getting totally. getting these an questions answered is huge, right? Where we thought that it was all our stories and organic, but really it was it was ads, right? We had something kind of similar with one of our brands, our jewelry brand, and we were doing just a small YouTube test. Uh, of course, we were running all their Google and that was going very, very well, but we wanted to test YouTube. They wanted to test YouTube. 
ran it for a little while and they were like, I don't know. I mean, the numbers, you know, in the different platforms, they look okay. And this one thing we've seen with YouTube a lot, under attributed in platform almost always. Totally. Like, well, you know, we're going to, we're going to ask, we're, we're, we're going to ask, actually, they, they didn't even think about this. They were just like, well, we don't know if we're going to keep going. And, and then they came back to us like the next week and they said, Hey, wait a minute. Um, we started doing post-purchase surveys and we started looking one out of five people this last week mentioned YouTube and they're like, Oh, let's, let's, let's jack up the spend here. Right. So it's one of those things where, yeah, maybe it doesn't show up in the attribution modeling, but you ask people and then you see it. And, And I'm curious too. Um, cause I, I got asked this question where I bought some, some apparel online. It was, a, it was a brand that I really like. And I saw this question of, you know, how long have you known about us? And I, I stopped to think about, it. I was like, you know what? I think I first heard about this brand like seven, eight months ago. And I just, I just hadn't done anything. Like I saw it, thought it was cool. Didn't need it. Kind of moved on, whatever. But the ads, I kind of saw the ads for a little while that went away. Then they came back, you know, um, any surprise learnings you're seeing there? I know with Fawn, you found the buying cycle was short 30 days, yep. but any any examples where you've kind of learned the opposite, where there's a significant number of people that heard about our brand months ago and they're just now purchasing? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. There was a golf brand that uh, a golf bag brand that we worked with or that uses Bestie, and uh, they were really really shocked by their results. Uh, they found that like sixty percent of their audience didn't hear about their didn't purchase until after a year, so they were in this like buyer's journey for a year, you know. And so um, one of the things for them. If you're a golfer, golfer is golfing is a seasonal sport. In some states, it's not. Obviously, um, you know, like in the in the Californias and the Arizonas and and uh, states like your your Florida, right? You can golf year round, and 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 in plenty of other states. But um, buying season, there's a difference between golfing season and buying season. And so, what a lot of these golf brands will do is they'll shut their ads down or they'll turn spend down dramatically in the off months. Um, and that's that's what this brand would do is they would turn their spend down dramatically. But it come come to find out like they need to be advertising in October so that they are going to have a really good February, March, April, May when when people really really start to buy. And so that was really shocking for them. Um, you tend to see that a little bit more though. Uh, any anytime anytime a I've recognized anytime something's above two hundred dollars you do tend to see the buyer's uh, journey extended a little bit more. Like that becomes less of an impulse buy. And so you start to get more responses like, oh, three to six to 12 months before I actually, you know, I heard about you before I actually purchased. So uh, yeah, we see it all the time. We, we see it short and long. I mean, the Fawn Design one was interesting because that was a $200 diaper bag too, but it was under 30 days, you know? Um, but But I also think a diaper bag can be very problem solution. So people definitely, you know, problem solution. There's there's an easy justification for the the diaper bag, right? I'm going to look like a good mom. I'm going to feel like a good mom. I'm going to be able to execute like a good mom. With golf equipment and some of those other things, like maybe I got to like justify this with my spouse, or maybe totally. I got to sneak in the purchase, or do I really need it? You know, so uh, maybe I'll ask for it for Christmas. You know, all kinds of things like that can can kind of come into play. So, uh, so so good. And I think this just underscores the more we know about our customers, the more we're going to shift. I would argue for the golf client, if I knew that my av, you know, 60% of people were waiting more than a year, um, I may look at, okay, I don't have enough urgency. Like maybe, maybe that's, maybe that's like too, maybe that's unnaturally long. Maybe I need to up my urgency sure. or how can I get someone in the list? How can I get them to purchase a little bit quicker? But I think part of that is it's just going to be a longer sales cycle. It's going to be longer than, than diaper bags or something else. And so then totally. I need to work within that. And yes, I need to maybe now advertise more in October and some of the off months. Uh, but if I know that I'm going to shift my behavior. So um, really, really good. Let, let's talk about kind of, uh, and, and I love the questions you mentioned so so far. Um, what else would you say are kind of top questions to ask? And are those the three you start with and then you go somewhere else? And then when and where should you be asking these? Yeah, uh, super good question. So uh, a couple different answers to those, right? So it's like attribution stuff is always great. To, to just be getting a better handle on things. You know, I think a lot of people rag on attribution with post-purchase surveys because they say like, oh, how does a customer remember? And, uh, you know, but at the end of the day, like sometimes it doesn't matter if the customer's wrong about what they remember. Um, because at the end of the day, it's what they remember. Exactly. They remembered it. You're going to see patterns as well. If it's true, if you start exactly. seeing patterns emerge with a lot of customers, it, you can bank on it being true or true enough to take action. A hundred percent. Yeah. Eventually things start to kind of, you get enough data and you're like, okay, hey, are all these people wrong? You know? Um, so 
So attribution is always a really good one. Those are the three questions I love the most. Um, I don't think that those three questions are good questions to ask alone. So if you're just asking, how did you hear about us? Um, that's tough because like it doesn't tell the full story. If you're just asking what brought you to the website today, if you're just asking how long have you know, it just doesn't tell the full story. So I like those three questions in those that story. Three, those three pair well together, like fine wine and cheese. Like you got to have them together. Absolutely. Absolutely. Some other really good questions. I talked about motivation. Motivation question is like by far one of my favorites because that that gives you your value props, right? You think that your value props, your unique selling propositions are X, Y, Z, but your customers are telling you exactly why, right? Hey, I, th- I thought that somebody was buying because eco-friendly, but they're actually buying because they want to help their kids' confidence. You know, I never thought about that. So let me change. And that like nowadays, like you probably know this, uh, especially on the YouTube side of things, like we know this from Meta and TikTok, like audience segmentation, uh, you know, like th- that kind of stuff, like placements, like that stuff isn't, there's no more silver bullets when it comes to media buying like that anymore. The silver bullets are how you create your content and how you message it, right? You know, and so like the motivation question is so pivotal because then you bring that to your creative team or your to your social media team or to your media buyers or whatever. And you're now telling them this is why people buy, you know? Yeah. And, and you can potentially maybe shift the audience you're building just a little bit, you know, on Google, you've got totally. the ability to kind of shift based on keywords and things like that. And, uh, but yeah, ultimately you're, you're shifting the angle and the story and think about how, how big of a difference this is. What if my ad was, you know, 30 seconds and, and 20 of it was about saving the environment. And then I just mentioned something about my kid's confidence. That's very different than saying, Hey, kids, kids struggle when they wet the bed, right? And when we've seen these studies that do this, but man, if you can increase that, con- I'm just totally making this up as I go, but totally you lean into confidence and you say, and what if you could cut the, the time training, you know, from an average of three months to just two weeks. And you know what? This is also, you're saving the environment. You're going to save Absolutely. money. Like those, yep. those become cherries on top or like the additional benefits. Cause everybody wants that. Like nobody wants to destroy the environment. Nobody wants to spend more. But those just weren't the primary drivers. So focus right. on what's primary and then mention those other things that really kind of push someone over the edge. And that is a big, big difference. That can be a, a total game changer for your ad campaign. So, so absolutely totally. love that. Uh, some other questions that kind of tie into motivation is like, uh, how do you plan to use the product? So what are you going to use this product for? Um, what problems are you trying to solve? Uh, why did you pick us over a competitor? Uh, what, what may have, what almost stopped you from purchasing today? Um, that's a really, really good Dude, one. I love that one. Any, any, in, any insights on that? Like any insights that have come from that question? What, what almost prevented you from buying? Um, yeah, absolutely. You get a ton of people who talk price. Uh, you get a lot of people who talk price compared to lack of review. Um, so I've recognized that the people who like, cause you can, you can do, at least with Bestie, you can do follow-up questions. Um, so if somebody says, Hey, it was a price thing you know, um, you can ask about the reviews or the testimonials that they saw. Did you see any reviews, testimonials, or do you have any social proof? And so I think that ties a lot into it. Um, you get some people who say your website was just really, it was really challenging to get through, you know, to get to the product page. That was really challenging. Um, uh, you get some people who, who just will flat out say, um, you know, uh, like, (laughs) Uh, we've seen responses such as uh, the the, cus- the competitor I was looking at was out of stock, and so I came to you. I mean, you get all sorts of stuff. You get all sorts of stuff. You were our second choice, but here I am. You know, you lucked out. Uh, but man, talk about valuable insight. So it shows how you stack up. And and man, what what insight would that be? Where you're like, yeah, you know what? I almost didn't buy because your website's so stinking hard to navigate. But I was really desperate, so I bought it. Right. Yep. So it's like, oh no, my website's great. It's converting. No, you're actually they're just. They want it so bad, you know, they're, they're fighting through your website. Um, so yeah, love that question. By the way, before I forget it, just a quick side note, we'll get back to this topic. You mentioned Utah a minute ago. I'm in Missouri. We're Midwest guys. Our golfing season is not the same yep. as our friends in California and Florida and Arizona. Um, why is Utah such like this D to C hotbed? I remember several years ago, we had a client in uh, Ogden, Utah, so Florida Salt Lake, which is, you know, I think, is it north? Is it north of Salt Lake? Yep. Ogden is um, north, yep. Yeah, uh, and uh, and maybe it was Logan actually, Logan. Anyway, um, but it, this guy was like, "Dude, you got to move out here." I'm like, "Well, I'm pretty plugged in, like in Missouri. I'm not moving." But he's like, "No, no, no. no the, the, the scene here is amazing. Like tech, D to C, it's happening." So, um, what are some of the you you post on LinkedIn recently? Some of the brands, the amazing brands that are in Utah. 
Uh, can can you can you run through some of those by memory? And and what's what's with Utah? Why is it such a hotbed of D to C and tech growth? Yeah, I mean, there's there's so many there's so many responses that I've heard from this down to re- from religion to uh, all sorts of things. But yeah, I mean, there's a lot of really cool uh, D to C back to businesses from like the tech D to C side of things, or also the merchant side of things. So. You've got Kizik, who's here. That's one of the fastest growing footwear brands in the world right now, uh, D2C footwear brands. Um, you've got brands like Kodiak Cakes that started here. Uh, you've got brands like um, uh, Clean Simple Eats, Just Ingredients. Uh, those are those are in the CPG space. Um, you've got Mixers, which is a big female-founded brand that's absolutely crushing it right now here in Utah. Um, you've got Gab Wireless. Uh, I'm not sure if you've heard of Gab Wireless, but that's, I have not. Uh, that's this massive brand right now, uh, where uh, it's it's phones for kids. So it's like giving them the smartphone experience without the dangers of smartphones. Dude, um, love that. Which is you have to look it up. They're they're one of the most fantastic brands right now. As somebody with kids, I love it. Um, Traeger. You've heard of Traeger? Traeger started Traeger, out totally here. Totally heard of Traeger. Yeah, got lots of friends. Yep, I have uh, my lifetime value at Traeger is stupid, uh, so that's great You're for v- me. VIP at Traeger. Yeah, that's right. Uh, also, um, shout out. I saw on your list uh, Thread Wallets. So yep, Thread shout Wallets. Out to uh, Colby Bauer, uh, he was he was on the podcast. Oh, amazing! Well, yeah, 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 yeah. Dude, dude's awesome. It's been a while. It's been a hot minute. It's, it's maybe been like three years ago. Maybe been pre pandemic. Yeah, Colby and McKenzie are great. Uh, you were about to say Skull Candy. That's another, Skull that's Candy, another yeah. brand that came out of Utah that's still here in Utah, kicking alive and well. I mean, list goes on and on. Uh, some some e com, uh, e commerce brands. Uh, you've got Pattern. That's uh, Pattern's absolutely massive. Um, you've got uh, Pillow Cube. Uh, Oh yeah, Pillow Cube is a big one. You've got Creatively. You've got uh, the I think Harmons Brothers came out of here. I think you've got uh, um, oh the the list is the list is big. Corso, which is route uh, shipping and insurance, like those guys came out of Utah. So it's it's massive. So uh, reasoning why uh, I don't know. You do have a uh, like. Utah is just in general a very entrepreneurial minded. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's place. what I've noticed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, uh, th- like I have some some theories I have behind it. Uh, is like you get a lot of young men who go on what's called Mormon missions, so like LDS yeah, yeah. missions to the um, to the two year mission. Man, it, it's like prime yeah. time preparation for uh, for being an entrepreneur. Yeah, I mean, one of the biggest one of the biggest. So I I am I, I am one of those people who did that uh, who did a two year mission uh, and. Um, one of the biggest things you un- you learn it, as a missionary is like number one hard work. You are working your butt off. Like it's nonstop. It's you're up at six a.m. You're in bed by ten thirty, and you're on a like a very rigid schedule. And it's during these years of your life that are really impressionable, right? Nineteen to twenty one years old. Um, and then not only that, but you are getting rejected literally twenty four seven. And and if you're an entrepreneur. Like rejection is, you just got to be used to rejection. You know, you got people who are telling you left and right that this is not going to work. Uh, you got your parents, especially like, you know, if you got older school parents who are maybe more in the baby boomer side who don't understand entrepreneurship, who are like, just go get the nine to five, you know. Um, so you get a lot of rejection. And so you're not afraid. You're not afraid of failure. And so I, I think personally that that's a huge, huge reason is like- I, I think it is too. Yeah. yeah. Like, I think it's huge because that, that, that learning to deal with rejection, and, and I, I got my start like in, in college, uh, was selling radio, trying to put myself through college. We got married young and I dealt with a lot of rejection. And then I realized this isn't that bad. Like this is, I didn't die. Like I get told no, but I didn't die. This is no yeah. big deal. Like I'm just going to keep cranking. And w- what's interesting, we're we're people of faith. I've got lots of uh, friends who are Mormons, but not not Mormon uh, myself. But sure. my son is selling solar systems door to door. Yeah, and it's another and like all the great companies totally are based out of Utah. Like it makes sense, you know. And so he's yeah. he's leading a team. He's in Connecticut right now, leading a team. But, but most of his buddies there are, are you know went on Mormon missions and stuff. And yeah, dude. I would agree, man. Like one of the best ways to to train as an entrepreneur or salesperson is is going through that experience. So there's also a couple colleges here as well that really like pride themselves yeah. in entrepreneurship as well. So like yeah. it, it's not just the, the religion side of things, but there are some colleges that are very very into it. Um, you also get on the other side of things, this kind of times, like Utah is a very family friendly culture. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so like 
traditional motherhood, fatherhood roles are very big. And you also get a lot of like big female founders here who have been moms who are thinking about other things that they can do. So you get a lot of moms out here who've started businesses that have blown up and just succeeded just out of solving a problem for other moms. Don't sleep on Utah, man. Utah's a, it's a rising place. star in the D to C place. Keep your eye on it. Uh, think about how you can partner there. And so, so really, really good stuff. So, okay. Awesome. Uh, love this topic so much. And, um, I'm just, my, my head is spinning and now I'm thinking of like questions and advice I got to give the <laughs> client so we can really maximize <laughs> what we're doing here. But, uh, but love that. So, so what about, so you talked about what problem are you solving? Why'd you choose us over competitors? Can you, can you, and I know I'm putting you on the spot here, but can you think of any, any insights or aha moments from, from those questions? I'm trying to think of a, why'd you choose us? Um, yeah, I can think of one. So there was a men's bag company who, why did you choose us over your competitors? Um, and a massive, massive response that we got. So one of the, one of these brands or one of this, this brand that was using Bestie, uh, they started to just like go really, really deep into the entertainment or the, like, uh, th there's a name for it's like combining entertainment and education at the same time. Uh, yeah. Ed edutainment. Edutainment, right. Um, space, uh, in, in, in something that was just kind of like bags, like kind of lame-ish, you know? And they went really, really hard on TikTok and started to get a big TikTok following uh, from an organic perspective. And so these people found that like, hey, the, one of the number one reasons people are picking us over competitors, bigger competitors that have a big name in the space is because they're following us on TikTok and they love what we're doing and the questions we're answering and how they're, you know, we've turned such a mundane thing into something a lot more fun and, um, you know, so, turn something mundane to fun and interesting. And so that was a huge reason why they're picking them um, over, a, over a competitor. Yeah, it's, it's so great. And it's just a reminder that, that yes, we do want good features and we want to save money or pay, pay a, you know, a fair price or whatever, but we also want to be delighted, right? And we want, we want something to kind of make our day better. And so sometimes just the content you create, the message you present is enough for someone to say, Hey, all things being equal here as far as features and stuff, I like your personality better. Totally. I, I get more enjoyment from working with your brand than with another. And so I'm going to go with you. I wanted one of my favorite stories, uh, Tushy, the bidet attachment uh, company. So I had Mickey Agarwal on the podcast uh, a couple years ago. And she talked about like, hey, we, we want to we want to communicate just like we're friends with people. And we want the, the whole journey to be fun and entertaining. And we want people to talk about it. So like they... They even we saved this like we we bought one for the office because people people requested it. But there's this little guy that's that's uh, this number two shall pass, and it's just like a, a series of puns like bathroom puns, and it, it's right. not it's so it's like part guide but then part just humor. And that thing has been passed around. Uh, hopefully, it didn't make trips to the bathroom and then get passed <laughs> around. I think, it's, I think it's all been contained in the office. Hopefully, but like people talk about it, it's hilarious. Like it's so much better than just a user manual, right? And so, right. So adding personality in what you're doing, it can allow you to charge a premium and really endear customers to you. So really absolutely, good really good stuff. Um, awesome, man. Well, hey, what uh, any recent episodes of the pod that you want to highlight that people should go back and listen to? Yeah, should we just have an episode where we just yeah? Um, I'm trying to think of maybe some of my favorite episodes. Um, you know, the Kizik we had the VP of marketing over at Kizik on. Nice. Um, he was awesome to to listen to. Uh, really, really cool to see what's going on uh, with you know that because what what happened is like the story of Kizik is is such a they they kind of switched their entire persona buyer of who was originally buying the shoe to who's now buying it now and, and how they've scaled to a, a nine figure business. Yes. Um, that's a really, really cool episode. I think, uh, we just did an episode where just my, the, co the, um, my co-host and I, we just did it. We didn't have a guest on. It was our actually most recent one. And it was actually one of my favorites where we just talked about like what content is converting right now. Like, what content is working to drive sales? Um, why is it working? Why is certain content not working anymore? Um, who are some, you know, what are some inspirational brands who are doing it cool? Who are some inspirational, you know, we, we dove into directors and, and tied like certain directors and how they create movies and why they're so good and, and some of those attributes and how you can, how you can pull that from your business. So yeah, that was a great episode. It, 
Any quick takeaways then on like what what is some of the content that is converting versus that isn't converting now? Gal, um, so one of the things we talk a lot about is you've got this. There's a lot of trends out there that merchants follow. Oh, I'm seeing a lot of people do use UGC right now, so I'm going to create UGC. You know, uh, I see a lot of people creating listicle ads, such as like you know five the five reasons why I bought, you know, a tushy or whatever. And so I think that there is this like there's kind of this two this two toned approach that you need to go about that brands should go about things. One is I think that following trends can be great. Try to be early in some of those trends because you'll see that UGC is still super important, but it is not doing what it used to do, and people are starting to see through a lot of it. So there, you got to go That's a little bit good deeper. UGC. It used to be just you run UGC, you exactly. win. Now it's got now it's got to be. This UGC has to serve a purpose. It's got to be, be real. authentic. It's got to be compelling. It's got to be good. Yeah. It, exactly. Right. Exactly. So, um, you know, it's it, how do you get to trends as quick as possible? You know, so totally good with doing that kind of stuff. Um, I, I don't think UGC ever goes anywhere. Um, what's now happening a little bit more, what we're seeing with UGC is UGC tends to do a lot better um, towards the bottom of the funnel. So, um, you know, it's like, hey, I don't really care what somebody thinks about a product that I don't know about yet. So tell me about the product first. Then I want to see, you know, a few people who look like they really love the product work with it. Um, but the other thing that's working really good is um, just storytelling ads. Uh, it kind of goes against the grain where, you know, nowadays it's like, hey, that, that first five seconds is so important, you know? So first five seconds is so important, which is totally true. But most people are thinking that those first five seconds is like five reasons why you should, you know, or this is why you shouldn't do X, or this is how I made more money here, or this is why my butt is getting cleaner, or you're getting these like really like like impactful hooks. But I even think that with how saturated TikTok is and what's happening with Instagram right now, you're, you know, you're getting so many people who are, that's becoming noise, right? Those hooks are becoming noise. I'm not saying that they don't work still and they can't, but when you just jump into the narrative of a problem, Oh, the other day I was doing X, Y, Z. Like that goes against the hook, like your general hook standards, but people are starting to key in on storytelling a lot more. And then if you can, if you can get to the problem really, really quickly, then, and you really follow a good story storytelling framework, which is like just jumping right into it. What is the problem? What is the solution? You know, and you're kind of like following it. That content's working really, really good. Yeah, I, lo- I love this. Uh, I really, I think this comes down to understanding why is something working. So if UGC is working or if listicles are working, why? It's not just because there's something magic in that. That's not just totally formulaic. There's something behind it. So understanding the, the psychology and the persuasion behind it and the attention grabbing factors, you got to understand that. And then I think you can kind of riff on things. And Totally. And I agree with you. I think like UGC will never die, but you can't just you know, wing it. Like you got to be good at UGC. Totally. And I think that's really key. So, uh, dude, this has been fantastic. Thoroughly enjoyed this episode. And so, you know, got to go check out the podcast and it is the unstoppable marketer to get that right. Yep. Nailed it. Unstoppable marketer and then bestie app. So how can people check out bestie? Give us the quick pitch. I think people are now like sold on your approach to asking questions, but why should I choose bestie and how can I learn more? Yeah, yeah. So bestieapp.co is where you can go. Um, we are for free trial right now. Uh, so go check it out. Um, we're more than happy to jump on a call with anybody and, and help you set some stuff up. Um, you know, we're kind of approaching things a little bit different uh, right now. There's there's plenty of post-purchase survey tools that you can look at. Um, but one of the things that we're most interested in is, um, you know, how can how can we deliver actionable insights uh, that that the user doesn't have to really do anything to figure out. You know, uh, marketers nowadays, we have like each one of us has a thousand tools we're looking at every single day. Uh, we've got, so we're being pulled in a hundred different directions. And so the question is, um, you know, how can we deliver those insights to you? So you have actionable ways to just get up, you see what's going on with your your surveys, you know what's happening with your customers and you got the actual tips to go and, and, and check it out. And so go check it out. We've got some really cool things happening right now. Um, uh, some cool partnerships and some cool uh, some cool feature drops that are going to happen in the next uh, couple of weeks. Uh, so go there. Uh, or if you want to just follow me on social media, all my handles are at the Trevor Crump. And I talk about Bestie all the time as well. So That is awesome. So check it out. Bestie 
app.co. You just got to do it. Get started. Do the free trial because when you know more about your customers, you know what to do differently. You know how to maximize things. Trevor Crump, ladies and gentlemen. Trevor, that was a ton of fun, man. You crushed it. Uh, we'll have to do this again sometime. Absolutely. Now I got to have you on mine. So we'll Absolutely. Just, we'll man, I thought you'd never yeah. ask. I was just like sitting over here like unstoppable marketer, all these cool guests. I'm like, we'll I've never you. been a guest. You seem unstoppable. <laughs> you seem unstoppable. So we'll get you there. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, dude. Uh, tons of fun and I uh, look forward to it. Thank you. Awesome. And thank you for tuning in. We could not do this show without you. And hey, we love your feedback. What would you like to hear more of? What other topics should we dive into on this podcast? Also, connect with me on the socials. Getting pretty active on LinkedIn, posting almost daily with some good stuff, good clips, good insights. Uh, So reach out to me there. Love to keep the conversation going there. And with that, until next time, thank you for listening. (laughs) 